I'm really passionate for pastor's wives because I'm one. I've been a pastor's wife for 38 years. And when I started as a pastor's wife, I was looking for a place where I could learn and grow and be trained. And um, 30 something, almost 40 years ago, that was a little, uh, wasn't there. Let me put it just bluntly. But today I praise God that not just the Urban Alternative has a ministry of pastor's wives. There's so many streams of opportunities for pastor's wives to grow and be trained and be equipped. And so we are happy to, as the ministry of the Urban Alternative, be a part of, of your growth and of your calling that God has given you. Because there's a saying that said, God does not always call the qualified, but he sure enough qualifies the call. And that's what we're here about today to be a part of qualifying the call because you are called for such a time as this. Today, I'm so delighted and kind of so proud as a mom to introduce my daughter, Crystal Evans Hurst, and I'm so glad she still uses her middle name. <laughs> she's the oldest of our children, and I don't know if I can use that word, but she's the most matured. She's the first one of our four children, and I'm gonna read her resume because I don't wanna miss anything because I'm so excited today that she's here. She's energetic, fun-loving, the girl next door who loves to encourage other women in fulfilling their full potential in Christ. Crystal firmly believes God's promise in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you, and she desires to help other women believe and apply that truth to their lives. Crystal earned a degree in finance from Texas A&M. She's a gifted writer, speaker, and worship leader. As a member of our church, Crystal assists me and her daddy, um, with daddy with lots of stuff, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, Crystal? And maybe you'll talk about that a little bit today. But specifically, she helps me lead our women's ministry, and I'm so excited about that. She loves to encourage women towards a deeper relationship with the Lord. Crystal has recently co-authored a book, Kingdom Woman, and you see that right behind me with her dad. You can also find Crystal's writing on blogs. It's called Crystal Chronicles, Crystal's Chronicles, where she poignantly reflects her thoughts about her faith and day-to-day -day experience. Most importantly, Crystal is a mom, and most importantly, she's given me five grandchildren, and she's married to Jesse Hurst. So I'm proud as a mom and as a woman in ministry to introduce my daughter to you, Crystal Evans Hurst who will be teaching us today in this workshop on developing women's ministry. Hello, y'all. Good morning. Are y'all awake? Yes. <laughs> well, it's my privilege and pleasure to share with you today. Um, in 2010, I did this workshop originally um, for the Kingdom Agenda uh, Pastors Conference. And I remember when my dad asked me to do it then, and I thought, why are you asking me to do it? Because I wasn't in any official capacity at the church and women's ministry. And, um, but I had gotten very busy in women's ministry and had done a lot of different things in a lot of different places in a lot of different seasons. And he said, yeah, you've been kind of all over the place. You'll know what to say. <laughs> and so I kind of pulled this together. And um, it was a blessing to me to... Um, to pull all the information together and to share it and to see how valuable it was, not just to women who were um, trying to start a women's ministry or trying to refresh their women's ministry, but <clears throat> there were also some pastors uh, who attended that, that uh, session. And the highest compliment that anyone ever paid me is a pastor came to me and he said, I wish every woman that was in ministry and every person that was in ministry could understand what you said because this thing about women's ministry is not just about women's ministry. It's about doing ministry within the church, any kind of ministry, and making sure that that ministry feeds well into the vision and mission statement of the church and the direction in which the pastor is leading um, his flock. And so I think from that standpoint, we want to talk about ministry, but we want to have this thing about women's ministry fit into the bigger scheme of any kind of ministry that we're trying to do at the church and looking at how what we have a heart for, what we feel called to, what we want to achieve in the context of that ministry, how it feeds into the broader vision and direction of the church, of our local church. And so um, can we just take a second and pray real quick before we dive into this juicy, fun stuff? 
Lord Jesus, thank you so much for every woman that's here, for every woman that's watching. I thank you so much for the heart of every woman that's uh, in this place. And I just pray right now that you would give her some specific practical uh, revelation, Lord, to remind her not only of what you called her to do, but specifically to give her direction and where you called her to go. We'll give you all the praise and glory for what you're doing in this room today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first of all, I want to talk about why women's ministry. There are lots of books written on the topic. There are lots of practical suggestions of how you do it and how you're structured and all that. And I want to get to a lot of that practical stuff later, specifically through the lens of what we do here at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, um, what we currently do and what we're working on. Um, but before we get to that, just talking about the the theory behind it, the philosophy behind it, because I think once you get that groundwork straight, then you kind of know where you're going with all the practical application of everything. First of all, there is a, a biblical mandate for women. If you look at your, uh, the uh, handout that you have or what you're looking at on the screen, you can kind of follow along with me where I'm going. There is a biblical mandate in Titus 2, uh, verses 3 through 5. The older women likewise are to exhibit behavior fitting for those who are holy, not slandering, not slaves. And then the older women are supposed to teach the younger women. And so at our church, the byline verse for our women's ministry has been Titus 2, 5, simply because that is the context in which the Bible specifically says, hey, make sure that those women who are seasoned, whether it's by age or by maturity, are with those women who need to understand how to do this thing. Because we've got a church where the pastor is preaching and we've got messages and we've got sermons and we've got Bible studies. That's great. But what we really need is a um, microcosmic environment where women who've got it in one area or another, and none of us have it in all areas at the same time, but a woman who has it can show another woman who needs it, how do I do this? How to love a husband, how to raise children, how to be holy, how to dress, how to speak, how to conduct herself, wherever it is that that woman may conduct herself. So that's the biblical mandate that we're basing the whole idea of women's ministry on. And then there's the general biblical mandate for discipleship. In Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so apart from women's ministry, there is this bigger mandate that says, Hey, make disciples. Tell them about me, then tell them how to live with me. So if we're not talking about women... In our churches, we have this mandate that says, make sure that people come to me and then know what to do, that they know how to study their Bible, that they know how to pray, that they know how to disciple other people. And then the third mandate is the biblical mandate for spiritual gifts. We all have different spiritual gifts according to the grace given us. And so we've got all these gifts between prophesying and faith and service and teaching, encouragement, contributing to the needs of others, giving, leadership. All of those things are gifts. And in our church, we have the opportunity to use our gifts on a broad scale, but then specifically in the context of women's ministry, we have the context to do that as we serve one another, as we disciple each other, and then as we have this context of Titus 2.5, where you have more mature believers that are discipling um, ladies who may just need some extra help in certain areas. And so all the way around, we can see that whether it's women's ministry or whether it's just ministry in the local church, we are told to touch hands, grab hands, and to say, this is how we do it. And that's the goal of what we're trying to do at Oak Cliff. There are three dynamics at work here when we're talking about women's ministry. And the first one is you and the Lord. None of this works if your relationship with the Lord is not where it needs to be, right? You cannot disciple other women. You cannot teach other women to do what you're not doing. You cannot disciple them in ways that you have not yourself been discipled. You cannot use your spiritual gifts if you have not had the opportunity to be trained and to be held accountable for those gifts within the local church. So there's this idea of funneling what you've received into somebody else, but none of that can happen if you have not first made a connection with the Lord and to stay connected there because this is all emanating from him. This is all based on, it's an overflow of our relationship with him. Second of all, you and your church. We have a lot of people, believe it or not, that in various ministries, not just women's ministry, but definitely in women's ministry, that sometimes get into a battle <laughs> with their church, so to speak. We want this. You're not giving us this. We need money. And they have, sometimes they develop their own agenda for what they're trying to do in their women's ministry. And again, this is one ministry that fits as a part of the whole thing. It's not just about what we're doing at our retreats or at our conferences. That's, that's not what the end goal is. The end goal is to support the local church and their efforts to train, facilitate, and disciple people that are there, that may come through the doors, that are members or maybe not. But this is a supporting function. 
to what is happening overall at the church. And then lastly, your relationship with women. Because ultimately, none of this works if, the, if you've got cat fights breaking out all over the place, <laughs> basically. And we know that when you put a bunch of women in the room, sometimes no matter how hard you try, you just got estrogen everywhere. And that just means that there's some working that we have to do. But again, that's microcosmic of the larger church because you're going to have that in the church as a whole anyway, right? So we're looking at all of these things through this lens of what does your relationship look like with the Lord? What does your relationship look like with your local church? And then what does your relationship look like with the other women in your church? You know, we've got um, so many situations where um, women are trying to have women's ministry. And it grieves my heart a little bit because I think we have watered women's ministry down to the next social gathering in a lot of places. It's what are we going to do to have fun? And there's nothing wrong with fun. What are we going to do to get to know one another? There's nothing wrong with getting to know one another. What are we going to do to have the biggest and baddest conference in town? And there's nothing wrong with having a great conference, but there's everything wrong with that being the end goal. Because if women come to a conference and they're really not actually drawn closer to the Lord, if all they had was a good time, or if they came to the conference and they leave and they still have no place to call church home, you've not offered that as an option and encourage them to get involved in their local churches. If they leave and they're not connected to other women, they're not encouraged to do Titus 2 on a one-to-one basis, then women's ministry really has failed. And so we want to continue to look at these things in those contexts because that is the goal. There are two active concepts at work, as I mentioned before, be and do. We're all familiar with the story of Martha and Mary, and I want to look at that just in the context of that story for just a second. In Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 42, Jesus and his disciples were on their way to meet in a home, and Mary, as we know, we've heard the story a million times. We've got Mary and Martha, and Mary wants to sit at Jesus's feet, and Martha wants to keep busy. And I think as women, we tend to have this struggle our whole life, really. (laughs) Are we going to choose to sit and be still at Jesus's feet? Are we going to get busy doing? And one of the dangers of being so so greatly involved in women's ministry is that you start being interested and being more actively engaged in the doing than you are in the being. Because there's always something to plan. There's always somebody to meet with. There's always somebody that needs prayer. And really, you can't do any of that well if you're not focused on the being. We have to have time at Jesus' feet, both individually as leaders in a women's ministry, but also corporately. If you're not corporately involved with being with your women's ministry group, getting to know them, spending time with them, having fun with them, praying for each other, studying with each other, it's really hard to offer to the women at large in your church what you're not doing with the women in your small group. And by small group, I don't mean official small group. It could just be the women who are serving with you alongside of you in the women's ministry. So we have to stay focused on that reality, that if you're not, if you're too busy doing and not enough time spent being that you could miss the whole point. And I've seen that happen over and over and over again. You want to be the person that he has called you to be so that you can do the job that he has called you to do. You want to fulfill the role that he's asking you to do, but first capitalize on his calling by spending time with him. And you want to understand at every step of the way what he's asking you to do, every left turn, right turn, and straight ahead. So who are you supposed to be? Let's talk a little bit about that. Obedient. Imagine that. (laughs) Obedient, meaning that you've got to spend time with him knowing what it is that he's convicting you of and then doing it. I think so many things get blocked in ministry in the church at large and specifically with women's ministry because the women who are in leadership are not obeying. They're not doing what God has asked them to do in their personal life, with their own husbands, with their children, in their relationships with folks at work, how they're handling their money. There's, you know, I mean, not that we have to be perfect because God's grace flows and his blood covers a multitude of sins, but at the same time, when God is convicted, Convicting, especially when we're in leadership. We have to be extremely responsive to that call, to his conviction, so that he can continue to work through us. We need to be students of the word. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, God's word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. When we are studying the word, his word becomes alive and active in us. And I think it becomes very easy for someone who has been in church for a really long time to start working off of their old word, And old word is good word because it's memorized word. It's word that you've come to know because of experience and walking with Christ. But old word is not the only word. You have to constantly be refreshing yourself in the word, continually uh, memorizing scripture, studying the word fresh for yourself so that you have something fresh to offer the women who are under your tutelage. Committed to prayer. 
We want to meet about everything. And meeting is wonderful. It's important. But don't forget the role of prayer individually and then corporately with the women who are serving with you. There are so many things that God can do on our behalf if we would allow him to. But we get busy with the doing, with the planning, with the meetings, with the task, with the checklist, with the spreadsheets. And we forget. We, do all, we, we will do our ceremonial prayer. <laughs> but the question is, is, are you really praying over that once you leave that meeting? Are you really bathing that in prayer when you're praying, praying for your children or your home? Are you also taking home with you? what you're working on in the church and the people that you're working with. Um, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Everything, not just the big stuff, but um, Lord, we're about to sign a contract with a hotel for our retreat. Will you please make that contract favorable for us? I mean, everything. He wants to be involved in the details. We want to be a passionate pursuer, next point, of a powerful relationship with God passionate pursuer of a powerful relationship with God. If you don't leave time in the word to read his directions for you, to hear his voice, to be obedient to the voice that you hear, how will you know that you're in his will? And I've seen a lot of people stay in a ministry, not just women's ministry, but any ministry, even in, in the corporate America in a job, too long because they don't know when it's time to move. And I believe that many of our ministries in church become stale because people don't know when it's time to make changes. And a lot of times it's because we would rather stay where we're comfortable and continue doing what we've been doing rather than hear, heed that still small voice that God gives when we spend time in his word to either change the way we do things or move people around or maybe it's time for us to go. And we get comfortable. And one of the things that I, I just love about Jesus's time on earth when he walked this earth is that he shaked things up and he did things differently and he really wasn't interested in in holding on to the status quo. But we like the status quo because it's less work. It's less work to keep doing the same thing that we've done every year because we have all the documents. <laughs> we've done it all. We've sent the same email. We've had the same spreadsheets. We've had the same checklist. We've had the same schedule. And sometimes God wants to do a new thing, but we are not able to recognize that simply because we're not spending time with him. We don't hear him when he says, tap that person on the shoulder, or it's time for this person to move into another position. We don't hear. We just want to keep things simple and easy. What are you supposed to do? Be obedient, be a student of the word, be committed to prayer, and be a passionate pursuer of a powerful relationship with him. And then what are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to discern his call. Now, how do you do that? I'm reminded of 1 Samuel chapter 3, where God was calling out to Samuel, and Samuel got up as a little boy and kept going to Eli because he did not know that that was the voice of God. And it's okay sometimes if we have to hear God speak to us a few times. I love the fact that God does not mind repeating himself. He repeats himself in scripture. He repeats himself to us personally. He'll repeat himself to us through other people. He does not mind repeating himself until we realize that that's him. The problem is when we realize that it's him and then we don't get up. So we have to discern his voice and then be willing to take action. We need to understand his priorities for us. We are lovers of ministry, but the Bible is very clear about what a woman should take care of first. If she's married, she's supposed to take care of her husband and her children and her home. If she's not married, she's married to Christ and she's supposed to take care of those things that are of priority for him in her life. And the church will suck you dry. It's the truth. It's the truth. And it's not because um, a lot of times the church is meaning to suck you dry. It's because women won't say no. We are more interested in the doing than we are in the being. And we get caught up in the being or get caught up in the doing and then realize that we're dry, that we are barren, that we are dry bones. And God never intended for us to operate that way. He, does, he intended for us to hear his voice, discern his call, and then understand his priorities for us. And then seeking wise counsel. One of the best things that I ever, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was anytime I'm about to say yes or no to anything, say, I will either pray about it or let me ask my husband or let me talk to somebody about it. Even if you know the answer is yes or no, there's something about giving yourself space and time to have your initial reaction to the question and then to go to God and say, now what's your reaction to the question? And I don't think we put enough time and space in between our decisions. Part of discerning God's call and understanding his priorities for you is to seek wise counsel from other people, whether that be a spouse or whether that be somebody else in ministry or whether that be a friend. But to say, hey, I'm faced with this decision. I don't want to make a quick decision. What do you think? Because a lot of times people can see things that are happening in your life when you cannot. They can see what God has been doing, and you'll realize when you listen to other people, hey, look what God did one year ago, and then look what he did six months ago, and then look what he did three months ago. Don't you see the dots? 
And sometimes having someone else speak into your life helps you to say, oh, wait a minute, I do see what God is doing. But we have to back up long enough to give other people that God has placed in our lives the opportunity to give us that wise counsel. And lastly, asking God to give us his vision. In James, it says, if you need wisdom, to ask. And sometimes we just need to ask for God to show us. We have a stirring in our heart. We know that we're supposed to be doing something somewhere, but we don't know exactly where. And we talk to everybody else but God. We will say, God, use me. But then the specifics of that, Lord Jesus, Susie Ann came up to me today and said, I should be doing that. What do you think? Or she sees this gift in me. You know, God, I'd never really seen that gift in me. What do you want me to do with that? And we don't have that kind of conversation over coffee with God sometimes. I think he really would love to have with us on a regular basis. Not about the big things, not about the spiritual things, but about the little things. What are you supposed to do? I guarantee you, if you take the time to ask God, to seek wise counsel, to take the time to read scriptures and understand his biblical priorities for you, and then to answer when he calls, you will know exactly what you're supposed to do. So my questions for you right now are, what are you resisting? What are you resisting in terms of God's authority in your life? There's always something, and it doesn't mean that if you start recognizing what it is today, you will conquer it today. But I want to challenge you, if you're looking at really moving forward in women's ministry or continuing to move forward in a place where God has already placed you to ask yourself, God, what barriers to me really being on fire and serving my local church in this way, what barrier in my life would get in the way of me really doing for you what you are asking me to do? And I guarantee you, if you ask him, you may not want the answer, but he'll tell you. (laughs) He will totally tell you exactly what it is that he wants you to lay down at his feet. And the second question I want you to ask yourself is if you feel led to be in women's ministry, how do you know that God has called you? How do you know? If you've never taken the time to write that down, I would encourage you to write down that journey. We are quick to forget the Israelites wandered around in the desert for 40 years, not because God didn't keep proving himself over and over or giving the same message. They just kept forgetting. And sometimes when we take the time to journal and write down what God has said, how he led us here, It reminds us of the fact that we really are supposed to be exactly where our feet are standing. And that journaling or that remembrance or, you know, however you want to do it on the computer or whatever, it helps you to remember when you're tempted to give give in and throw in the towel, God really did put me here. He really did put me here. Your relationship with the church. Let's talk about that for just a brief moment. Who are you supposed to be and what are you supposed to do? Remember, the two things are be and do. A person submitted to the vision and leadership of your pastor and his supporting staff. You may not like the way they do it, but you are supposed to be in a supportive role in this ministry, in this microcosm. And a lot of, I've seen women really disrespect the authority in their church by the way they talk to their pastor or they, they talk to other people that are in uh, an authoritative role. And we really need to watch that. We know we talk about that all the time in marriage. You know, a woman's supposed to watch her tone and how she talks with a man in respect. That's just all men. You know, let's just say that. It's just all men. All men in some degree, they need to have this sense that there is a respect for who they are and what they do. And that applies in the home. It, it applies. I've seen it apply in corporate America. And I've seen it apply in the church. You will get a lot more done if you respect the positions that are at work in your church. A student of your church's visions, goals, procedures, and practices. If you don't know what your church's mission statement is, if you don't know what their typical process and procedures are, if you don't understand who does what, find out. Find out what is happening in the bigger picture, not just in this little women's ministry spot, but in the bigger picture. And how does what God has called you to do fit in the bigger picture of what your local church is doing? And then make your prayer time a time to pray for your pastor and the other staff. Don't exclude, just the, don't exclude everybody else and only pray for your senior pastor. Pray, make it a point to pray for all of the staff because all of those staff, especially the pastoral staff, they are supporting the pastor and they're supporting that vision. So if you're not able to really get behind the whole pastoral staff in prayer, then that will hinder what you're able to do. And then quickly, what are you supposed to do? Before you meet with your pastor, pray again. Get permission for whatever you're going to do. We like to take things and run with it stop and get permission because you will realize that that will save you lots of pulling back. (laughs) Just make sure you have permission to go before you move on ahead and then be prepared. We like to talk for 30 minutes about the beauty of the pink and the green and the black and the brown and whatever the colors are. They don't need to hear all that. What is the bottom line? What do you need to know? And nine times out of 10, it's going to be about money. 
How much is this going to cost? When you meet with your pastor, make sure that you understand their values and their beliefs, their vision, but come prepared to have the conversation and to say from A to Z what needs to be said as quickly as possible. So I'm going to pause there so we have a chance for some Q&A, and then we'll pick back up there with the rest of the goody stuff to get into the practical information. Okay. I think I'm seeing questions here. How should we deal with women who are continuously, rebelliously serving in leadership? Okay, so that could mean a couple of things, actually. <laughs> the women who are rebellious <laughs> and the women who are rebellious and they continue to serve in leadership. Um, well, I think it depends on where the woman is serving, first of all. I think if she's within the women's ministry and you are asking this question as someone that is in authority of her in women's ministry... I'm a big proponent of the church is the church, but God is a God of excellence. And I think that a lot of times we dilly dally with things way too long because it's the church. Um, I believe that things should work pretty much the same way they work in a corporate environment where you communicate, you say what the problem is, you give them an opportunity to fix that. Maybe you communicate again. You give them an opportunity to fix that. You pray about it. You discuss it. Give them examples. Two or three are gathered. You need to have the witnesses where other people come in maybe at that point. But after about the third time, I mean, you know, four is pushing it. I would say that person just does not need to be in that position. Now, if it's not your decision to, to move that person from that position or maybe not pull them completely out, maybe the spot that they're in is just not the right spot for them. Maybe they need a shift. If, they are not, if that's not your role and your responsibility, then I would say that then you bring in, um, uh, if that person is a peer, for example, that then you bring in the pastor that's in authority of you, whether that's a senior pastor or another pastor on staff. But either way, I think the goal is to clearly state what the issue is, to give examples. When you said this, like that, that was inappropriate. Um, we need you to uh, make sure that when you're speaking to the pastors that are in authority that you are doing so in a respectful way. I mean, you know, whatever that rebelliousness is. Now, if it's decision-making where it's like they told me to go right and I went left, if it's blatant disrespect, I, I think one time is enough. I think one time is enough. But I think really you have to pray about that because the severity of that situation that and, and who all it affects and how many people it affects really determines how long you can suffer with them. The issue here is not only wanting to disciple and grow and develop the person who's in ministry. Um, it is also to protect the flock that they are ministering to. And so where you want to be as long-suffering as you can as, and as developmental in terms of chatting with that person as you can, if, they, if the cost of dealing with that person is greater, if it's infecting a group of people, um, then you really want to cut that out where you can. And again, it doesn't mean excommunicate the person. It just means that spot for that person is not the right place. Another question, do you think it is important to break up the groups according to age? I really believe that you need to look at your church and figure out what your church needs. I'm not a proponent of all by age groups, you know, the 20s together and the 30s together and the 40s together, or forcing mixed groups, because I think you have people who want both. You have women who just want to be with moms their own age, or single women who just want to be with ladies who can hang out on Friday nights, or you have women who, um, who want a quilt, and they're 60, and they're making quilts for their grandkids, and they want to do that on a Wednesday when everybody else is at work. I mean, I think you have to look at those pockets and say, what are the needs of my women? But you've got so many women, and please hear me when I say this, so many women who are in dire need are begging for mentors. They are begging for women who will take the time to sit with them, to study the word, and to say, show them, how do, you, how do you do this? And that will happen in the context of small groups that are multi-age. The key for me in whatever you do, whether it's structuring your women's ministry or it's developing your small groups, is look at what you have. So if you have a woman who is willing and has a heart for a multi-age group, let her have the multi-age group. If you have a woman who's 25 and would love to have a group, she's excited about having a group of moms with kids her own age, let her have a group of moms of tots. Look at who wants to lead. Where is the cream of the crop rising? Or where do you see people that may not be excited about taking the helm, but you see they are completely capable of taking the helm and say, hey, why don't you start a group? Or I see that you have a group of three or four friends. Why don't y'all become a small group? Maybe a couple of other people can join you. So again, I think you look at who you have and then decide both in your church and what the needs of your women are, what the best kinds of groups are for you. And your women will tell you if you ask them. 
As a first, as a new first lady, how much is too much to divulge about yourself as you try to connect with the women of the church? You know, that question is really, the only way to answer that is what the Lord leads you to share. And then, it, you know, obviously you want to be protective and honoring of your husband's position, what he's comfortable with you sharing. But I think the Holy Spirit will begin to prod and prick your heart when there is an area of your life that he wants you to share. And it's not always with everybody. Sometimes it's with one person, one-on-one -on -one in a counseling situation, and they just need to know enough that you've been there. There's a first lady that's a friend of mine, and um, I remember calling her about some issue in my marriage, and I just remember being so awestruck with how she handled it. She told me just enough to let me know that she'd been there without telling me too much to make me think less of her husband or to make me question their marriage. She just told me just enough to say, um, I've been there. And I think only the Holy Spirit can give you guidance with that. There are some things right now that in my own life I would love to share, and I don't because my husband is uncomfortable with that. So I think those two things, whether you feel the Lord pricking your heart, where you sense a need from somebody and the Holy Spirit convicting you in that direction, and then what would be um, a blessing to your husband or your children, because a lot of us talk about our children like dogs. <laughs> and we don't realize that those people then have a picture of your children by what you say. They don't know them at home. They just know that you're having a bad day with them. And the only thing they will remember is what you said about them on that day. So we want to cover our family members and our friends. We don't want to hang anybody out to dry, but we do want to follow the Holy Spirit's leading. And really that has to be a matter of prayer. Question, how do you handle women who love and support the pastor, who loves and supports the pastor, but the pastor's wife? I'm assuming that means they love and support the pastor, but they don't <laughs> love and support the pastor's wife. Um, you know, I, I have seen this happen, um, and I've seen not just pastor's wives, but wives of uh, men in ministry where they are dry and bitter and could care less about the church because of how they've been treated. And if, you know, if there are any uh, pastors or men in ministry that are watching this, cover your wives. Cover your wives. Because if you don't um, encourage and set the standard for uh, the people in your church for how they should treat your wife, how they should address her, how they should um, accommodate her in meetings, that if they don't understand how valuable her opinion and her word is to you, then you are setting her up for that disaster. You are setting her up for her to be looked down upon because as a pastor or somebody on staff, you're the decision maker. You're God's chosen one. You're the person who's, um, who God has placed here. And your wife, if you don't treat her as anything more than just the person who helps me get dressed on Sundays or the person who's with my kids, that's exactly how people in the church will see her. So it really is up to a husband to make it his business to raise the bar of respect for his wife. Now that said, if she's not being treated well, she's not being treated fairly, I've seen a lot of women be very, very successful at letting people know in a very kind and gentle way how they should treat her. And unfortunately, um, it's not that you want to treat other people like children, but I'm going to use this as an example. If you have a child come up to you, whether you're their mom or not, and they're talking to you a little bit crazy, you can correct them and you can correct them in a very loving way. Um, sometimes people just need you to look, cock your head to the side just a little bit and say, excuse me, for them to realize that how they said it was just a little bit out of line. And if you remember when you were in school, you'd have a teacher like that, that just would kind of let you know by the crook of her head and by the tone of her voice that you stepped over the line. And we can do that in a very loving way. Um, I think that... Uh, when you say to people by what you participate in, how you respond, how you dress, how, uh, you, how you decide what you show up for and what you don't, by, you can teach people how to treat you. You really can. And although we want to love everybody and although we want people to feel that we love them, that does not mean that we have to be a mat. And there's a difference between understanding our value and who God has created us to be and what he is asking us to do and letting everybody else define that. And we just have to show up at whatever they ask us to do or to be at and do whatever they ask us to do. So I would say you have to know your value and hopefully your husband will... Um, treat you with the value that you inherently know that you have, both from the Lord and then the value that he's giving to you if you're married. But ultimately, you have to know what God is asking you to do, and you have to know when to tell people to stop. It's completely okay if you have to pull someone to the side and tell them that. 
Um, I just want you to understand. I appreciate you. I don't know if you understand what you did or how you said this, but it was very disrespectful. And I'm here to support my husband or I'm here in this role at the church. And it would, it would really bless me if you would keep that in mind when you're talking to me or when you're talking about me to other people. It's okay to school people a little bit. Just make sure that you do it in love. Okay, I think we're wrapping up that portion of Q&A and we're going to continue. Awesome, 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 awesome. So let's jump back into where we left off. We were talking about your relationship with the church. We were talking about being prepared when you talk to your pastor. And I want to give you some specific examples of that. Right now, we're in preparation for next year for a few things with our women's ministry. And I've learned what's important to Pastor Evans, to my dad. Now, it took me a minute to learn that. It took me a minute to learn it, and there was a lot of um, go fetch. You know, well, what's the answer to this question? I don't know. I'm going to go fetch it. What's the answer to this question? I have no idea. I'll go fetch it. Keep notes of what you're doing. Keep notes of what you're doing because next year it will happen again. <laughs> it will happen again. The questions that uh, your pastor or your, uh, the, the staff that's in authority over you that they're asking, it, you always want to know how much money you're spending. Keep track of how much money you're spending. You always want to know what your plans are for the year, who's in leadership. You want to have a pulse on who you're working with and what you're expecting them to do. Um, and again, understand the mission statement, the values, and the goals of your organization, of your ministry, of your church. Do your homework. If your numbers are not increasing and your pastor is asking you, why aren't they? Do your homework. Because he probably cannot handle your touchy-feely answer of, well, we don't know. It's just that so many women just seem to be wanting those video Bible studies or so many women just want us to have, you know, potlucks. and that, that, No, no, no. Why? And how do you know why? In quantitatively um, specific information, you ask. You ask. There is a lot of investigative work that goes into understanding the people that are involved in your ministry, what they need, what they desire, what they need in order to be fed, how much it's costing the church, where you need to be, where you need to be situated. Ask. A lot of times we get busy figuring out things in our own head (laughs) and we don't stop to ask. One of the most powerful things that you can do either on an annual basis or on a semi-annual basis, twice a year, maybe at the end of one season and the, be- and the end of another, at the end of the fall semester and the end of the spring, is to give your women an evaluation. Paper if you have paper and pen kind of people or survey monkey if you have women who are digitally uh, astute. But either way, ask them. And the kinds of questions that you develop, well, you, you figure them out the first time around on your own, but then Um, from the questions that you're getting from your pastor or other staff, you can make up those questions as you go along and the survey will get better and better every year. Know how to speak man. Be conscious of his time. I talked a little bit about that. Address his concerns. Money, 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 money. Be a leader and be the change you want to see. I've seen, and I've been guilty of many times, coming into a meeting with all the things that I'm asking for, but basing that on a place of complaining this isn't working, or we didn't have enough money last year, or if y'all would only do this, if we could only get this support. You have to ask for what you need for, but at the same time, the place of where you're coming from should be a place of gratefulness. It should be a place of thank you for what you've done to support the women in our church thus far. Even if there isn't a women's ministry, thank you for how you've ministered effectively to us as women about what biblical womanhood looks like. And because we want to continue that, because we want to be an extension of that based on Titus 2.5. We want to have these things that work in our women's ministry. Pen on paper. It's great to come talking, but if you can put those things down on paper where he can look at that later, where it can be emailed in a soft copy to anybody else who needs to understand what you're doing, that is so important for you to have that stuff in black and white and lined up. Resist the urge to criticize what has happened before or even what is happening now. If someone was in leadership before you and they completely did a botched job or the thing shrunk from 500 women to 30 women, make no mention of that. You're here right now. You're here excited right now. You're called by God right now. And just walk in the door with a detailed explanation of what you'd like to do right now. There's no need to mention how things have been wrong in the past and run other people down. We are all here because we believe that there is a need Um, to do this thing and do it right. So let's jump into some more of the nuts and bolts of this. The networking within the church. Um, In our church, we don't have, we have certain things that live under women's ministry and certain things that live in other places. Be a student of your church and understand whatever could relate to women's ministry wherever it lives. Meaning it doesn't have to be your sole responsibility in order for there to be a strong connected line to that ministry. Um, If you've got Uh, let's just say you've got a Christian education ministry and they hold parenting classes. And let's say that that's not officially in your women's ministry. But 
when women come to your church, they don't understand the back office of how your church works necessarily. They just know I'm a woman and what is of concern to me. So in order for you to effectively be in women's ministry and come to your pastor to say, this is what I want to do, you need to already know what things are in effect in your church that might be of benefit to women. So you want to network within your church, whether it's women's ministry or child care, media, worship, Christian education or hospitality. What is your church already doing? Because there's no point in you reinventing the wheel. So ask yourself this question. Who will you need to visit with at your church in order for you to discuss not just the women's ministry that you're responsible for, but the women's ministry that the women who come to your church will see? Because sometimes those are two different things. And that's okay. Different churches are structured different ways. But it's your job to understand what is happening already at my church for women and to look at ways that you could build on what is already happening and where money has already been put. Because when your pastor is talking to you, he's thinking about staff that he already has, money that he's already spent, facilities that are already in, in progress or at work. And he wants to know how can you best utilize those resources, both people, finances, and facilities to affect the change that you're wanting to affect. So ask yourself those questions before you even make that visit. All right, now the relationship with the women. This is the good part. You need to be a person who cares for women. Now, I'm a very task-oriented person, and I do care for women. I do. But I know that one of my weaknesses is really doing a great job of that. So I know that I have to have people around me that don't get distracted by the next thing. And I have to work on that but there's a difference between you having a heart for women and it being your gift to pray and sit there and spend 30 minutes with the same woman every Sunday that has the same issue. So you have to know what your gift is for leading your women's ministry. And we all have gifts because the woman who can pray with that, the woman in your ministry who can pray with that woman in your church who has the same issue every Sunday and needs a 30-minute prayer may not be the woman who can manage a meeting. She may not be the woman who can organize a spreadsheet or who can set up a task list, and that's okay. You need to understand what the women are in your ministry, what their gifts are, but even if your gift is not so much a super people person, you have to have a heart for the women of your church. You have to believe that God has called you not just to run a program, but to develop and disciple. That goes back to what we originally said, to develop and disciple the women and to teach them how to be women after God's own heart. So be a student of the women that you are serving to be an intercessor for the women that you served. What are you supposed to do? Who are you ministering with? Pray for a team of women to come alongside and assist you. Pray for a team of women that are relationally already connected to you, but pray that God would bring women who you never would have picked them out of a crowd to be a friend, that they are so needed in this team of women to serve the women in your church. And God will do that. He will bring the most, likely, the most unlikely woman from the most unlikely pew in the back of the church to be an integral part of your ministry if you are open to that. And a lot of times women's ministry can turn into a huge click because we only want to work with our friends. And what you're missing out of what God did when he said, I've got my 12 disciples and I've got the people I'm working with. But as he developed those disciples, he didn't just start with all the same people in all the same place. He started with some people that were over here in this sea. He went over here and found this person that was, you know, a tax collector. He went around and he said, I'm looking for you. And so your heart for women needs to be that I'm going to establish a team. I'm going to pray about my team. And I'm going to ask God, though, and I'm going to be open when he brings women that would not normally be in my line of sight, but they're in his line of sight. So be open to God's direction in that area. Pray for discernment because there are things you may not see correctly. There are women that God can just, and I've had it happen where God just tells me, not her, not now. And it's not until a year later. I don't have a reason. It's not until a year later where I can see the mess that she's caused somewhere else and go, oh, okay, Lord, I completely understand what you were saying. Take the time to pray over your women's team. And everybody that says I, I is not she. Okay? But we have to be careful about not allowing women in who say I, I because we don't know her, because we're not comfortable. We really have to make that a matter of prayer and let God tell us who is the right person for the right position. Assemble a women's leadership team. Look for who is already leading. There are people who are leading. 
Now, they may not be leading the ministry. They may not be leading a small group. They may not be, you know, leading in the usher team or the hospitality group, but they are leading because they're always ahead of the pack. They're the first one to respond when someone has a need. They're the first one to show up all the time. They're the first one to offer their help and serving to set up or break down. Look for those people who are already putting their best step forward to serve. Because nine times out of 10, if they're doing it when they don't have a title and they don't have a position, they'll keep doing it when they do have a title and when they do have a position. And a lot of times those women who are serving faithfully will never come to you and say, I, I. But if you see what they're doing and you tap them on the shoulder and you see their gifting, you can say to them, hey, I see what you've been doing. You've been so faithful. It would be such a blessing to me or a blessing to our ministry or a blessing to the church for you to do that in that capacity. Look for who's already leading. Figure out what are your strengths and weaknesses and ask God to show you those women who can fill in the blank. Your women should represent a peer group. If your women are all of one age group and your church is of all of these age groups, you really need to be purposeful about intermingling the ages. Now, I went to one church in Houston and I thought it was the greatest thing ever. They had a uh, women's, I don't know what they called it. It was a women's board or women's committee, but everybody on there rotated out. And the woman who was the director of that ministry uh, was on there for four years. She, she committed for four years or whatever the time frame was. Maybe it was three or four. But the other women were on there and they were staggered for two years. So every year there was somebody rotating off. And every year it was the job of that person rotating off to find someone else to disciple for her position. Now I'm not saying that every church needs to have that structure, but I'm saying they had the idea right that we don't get stuck. We don't get stuck with the same people doing the same things. And whether you officially disciple people and have them replace uh, ladies that are in positions or whether you um, inadvertently uh, or unofficially disciple women so that they can come alongside, there should always be this idea that we want to have fresh blood. You want to have fresh ideas. You want to have people that aren't tired. Because the, the very people that come in sometimes with the biggest ideas, and I'm guilty of this, I'm a big idea person and I always have a, an idea, something we can do differently or we can do it better. But you will... You will quench the energy and excitement that many women can bring to your church if they don't have a place to work those ideas out. And it's hard to work in new ideas. (laughs) Like I said before, it's easier just to let things be done the same way they have always been done. But you will bring new life and new blood and new energy by including new women or new ideas. So be faithful to do that. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just to make sure I have enough time to deal with the nuts and bolts of this stuff. We talked about diversity, being faithful, um, the size of your team. There should be personal accountable, the last point here, financial accountability, and the opportunity to establish and fine-tune your purposes and plans. Part of your group, uh, part of your leadership team, it's not just so that they can come in and do whatever you need them to do. It really is a small group. And if you have a small group, that's great. But if you are leading this group of women, it is your responsibility to pray for them, to call them, to talk with them, to understand what's happening in their life. And it's their responsibility to do that for one another. If you're not pouring in to the people who are pouring out, then they won't have anything to pour out to everybody else. So when you are managing your team and working with your team, keep that in mind because there is that responsibility for you too. Transfer the vision. Now that you understand your vision, the vision of your church, the mission of your church, make sure you are actively transferring that vision to the ladies at the table. They're not just there to dis- to uh, discuss the plans for the next event. They're there to understand how they fit into the overall scheme. And then um, lead Jesus style, skipping down to that last point. Jesus was a servant leader and he showed, he told, but he also did a lot of showing. And so you have to understand what your gifts and talents and abilities are and your time uh, restraints and all that. But they will learn best by watching you do it. The most infectious women ministries, the most infectious churches are the churches and ministries where they are a direct reflection of the person who's in authority. They are a direct reflection of the pastor and the women on the women's ministry team are the direct reflection of the women's ministry leader. Whatever you want to see happening in your women's ministry, if it's women loving on one another, if it's women showing up with a meal, if it's women that are constantly encouraging each other with their words, or if it's women that have a high standard for how they, how they dress and present themselves, you be those things. And what will happen is your team will follow suit and they will infect the people that are in their situation as well, in that ministry as well. So let's consider your team structure. Um, generally speaking, this is a great one. I got this from Designing a Women's Ministry by Jean Maripoti. 
You want to have the women's ministry director. She's going to have overall responsibility and then be accountable to either the senior, senior pastor or whatever pastor in, on the staff that she's accountable to. But she is the hub of information. And sometimes that women's ministry director, a lot of times she will have an assistant. So I didn't put that on here, but she would kind of be stuck out to the side. And then underneath her, she would have team leads or, you know, whatever you want to call them. But they would be responsible for that specific area of women's ministry. So maybe that is the... Tuesday morning Bible study, or maybe that is the retreat, or maybe that is the conference, but they would be under her, and then you have a bunch of volunteers. Um, I would make sure that you're meeting regularly with those team one, team two, team three ladies, and then meeting occasionally um, as the, these events are ramping up with the rest of those volunteers because they do need to see you. They need, do need to continually hear uh, the vision casted because people will forget. We will forget and we will get wrapped into whatever we're doing and our goodie bags and all that kind of fun stuff. And we'll forget what the goal of the pastor is. At our church, outreach is a big deal. And so at everything that we do, we are always reaching out to have some part of our Bible study doing outreach. Our ladies Bible study um, that meets on Tuesday morning, we will support a missions event of the church once each semester. So they tell us what they need, what they need to take to Haiti, what they need to take to Africa or Kenya or wherever they're going, Nigeria, and we bring a bunch of stuff. And, and they love that. They love that they can always count on us for that. We also have a relationship with one of the homeless shelters in town. And when we have our one of our quarterly events, and I'll get into that in just a little bit, um, we are all down here having a good time. We have the homeless shelter bust those ladies down here, and we have a whole separate breakfast for them, make them feel special. We take care of their kids for the day because that's a relationship that our church, remember we're talking about what our church in the, in the larger sense is doing. That's what our church is doing in a larger sense. So we just take our women's ministry and we say, how can we plug in? Well, the ladies need to serve, and the ladies do want to be involved, and they do want to give, but we don't want to have these offshoots of all these random things that we're doing. We want to plug into what is our church doing, and that's how we... That's how we do that. So you want to continue to be involved. And let me look, if you turn the page, if you have this worksheet, you have this wheel. And this is another way to look at it. And this church has a whole lot of stuff going on. So depending on the amount of things that your church going, has going on will determine your structure. But you have in the middle circle, you see the administrator, you have the treasurer, you have uh, special activities and special events and spiritual growth. And then if you look at special events, it's kind of to the top right hand corner of this wheel, you've got... They've got a spring tea, they've got a Christmas brunch, and they've got a leadership uh, leaders appreciation event. I mean, this thing can go as deep as you want it to go, depending on the size of your church and the leadership that you have. But let me encourage you, don't do more than you have the volunteer support for. If the women have loved the tea every year for the last 20 years, but the lady who's done it for the last 20 years has resigned and nobody's taken her place, let it go. Because you will stress yourself out and you will stress everybody else out trying to do what there is not a person that God has gifted and called to carry on that ministry. And you'd be surprised when you let something go, even if it's just for a small season, that will cause somebody else to realize, I miss it. And it will create in them a need, a conviction to fill in the spot. But they will never fill it in is if you, if you figure out how to keep it going at all costs necessary. So do what works for your church. Do what you can afford and do what you have the people to support. So there are lots of questions here that you could ask yourself um, in terms of the things that we've just discussed. But I would specifically uh, like you to look at two. The first one, write down the names of two to three women that you can invite to pray with you. To pray with you because prayer, if it is not covering everything from your activities to your team, you will be out there on your own. And that's not what you want. Now, these two or three women can be women who are on your women's ministry team or not. You know, prayer doesn't mean that they have to officially be part of the team. They just need to be praying for what God is doing in you. I would ask you to identify them. And if you have not specifically, as of today, identified those ladies and asked them to pray for you and with you, let that be the first thing that you do. The second thing that I'd like you to make sure that you do is to think about your strengths and your weaknesses. What are your strengths with leadership? What do people already tell you that you do well? And it's great if you don't do everything well because that means there's plenty of room for other people to come in and do what they do well. What do you do well? And then what are your weaknesses? What do you need a little bit of support with? If you are a social butterfly and everybody knows that you care about them and you're going to hug them and you're going to know the names of every single one of your children, but you can't keep up with what happened in the meeting to save your life, you need administrative help. And that's okay. So part of building your core team is figuring out what you can do and what other people can do. That's the, that's the crux of where we want to start. What am I supposed to do and who am I ministering to? Okay, keep it simple. 
Understand the woman you are serving, but keep it simple. Don't do more than what you can handle. Don't do more than what you have the volunteers to support, but ask your women what they need. And then once they tell you, do what you can do. Do surveys, do focus groups where you just kind of at random touch women on the shoulder and say, hey, I'd love to have you over for coffee or have you know, brunch with you after church or invite you over for dinner because I'd just love to talk to you. And do that two or three times with different groups of people. You'd be surprised at what people will tell you with one-on-one that they will never put down on a survey or that they will tell you when they're reminded of something because they're in a group with three to five women and one woman says something and then the other woman goes, oh yeah, I kind of forgot about that. And you will be surprised when you bring women together in a focus group what relationships gets developed by you just having them over to your home for coffee one day. So I encourage focus groups. Talk to women as much as you can. Um, Look at the church demographics. Understand the age of the women in your church and um, what they need. You have all kinds of women in church today with all kinds of needs. You've got married women, single women, young moms, working moms, single moms, divorced women, widows. They're in grief recovery. They've got chronic illness. They've got financial stresses. And in the women's ministry, again, you don't have to do it all. Look for what else is being done in your church. We have uh, free at last support groups at our church, and they uh, deal with things like uh, chemical dependency or um, women or men, too, who need to lose weight or people who are dealing with uh, folks that are in prison. Now, those things are not specific to women. Guess what? And that means we don't have to reinvent the wheel. When we have a woman that comes to us that it needs divorce care, we don't need to have a separate group for divorce care if our church already has a group designated for that. So understand what you have, understand the women who are at your church, and then figure out what are the things you need to provide for your women. Okay. So let's talk about some ministry options, and I want to, before we close, tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, you can have Bible studies. Many churches do that once a week on a morning or once a week on an evening, or some larger churches have them multiple times a week. But just because the women's Bible study is the thing to do, know what works for your church. If your church is a church of small groups and people are already in small groups and you're stretched, you don't have to do the women's Bible study. Be free. If your church does not have small groups and your women are dying to get together, then create that for them either in the morning or the evening. Um, Mentoring is another idea, having women one-on-one. And a lot of times, you've got women who are mature who would love to mentor, but they're not going to do it on their own. They'll give you their name, and then younger women will give you their name, and then your job is to match them up. But don't say, oh, mentoring's not happening in my church because the older women won't mentor the younger women. Sometimes they just need a place of connection. And at our church, we've got a few things happening. We've got uh, Bible study happening on Tuesday mornings. We've got um, our women's conference that happens every July church-wide, and we invite the community. We've got uh, small groups happening. We have those free at last groups happening. We've also got this thing called Gathering of the Girls that happens two or three times a year, and it's designed to be for our church and for mentoring to happen in a very unofficial way. Meaning we'll have a large group, we have a speaker, it's uh, real fun, we sing songs, we do all that, and then we break up. And because I happen to have been at this church for so long, I kind of know people. So I'll say, "Um, Sister Ann, I know that this is your second marriage and I know that you have a blended family. Would you mind talking about your blended family experience? And they'll take one of these rooms up here. She doesn't have to be a speaker and she doesn't have to have notes and she doesn't have to have a PowerPoint. She just gets to tell her story. And then she gets to have women who go, I need that story. Say, can you tell me how you dealt with this? How did you deal with that? The woman who's had breast cancer or the woman who's, um, who's a nurse who has experience with that. Do you mind having a room where you can just talk about your experience and how you made it? And then women are like, oh my gosh, there's somebody in this huge church who gets me. Or I have small children and I don't know what to do with them all day. And we have an older woman who says, let me tell you what I did with my kids all day. And they would never make that connection in church on a Sunday morning, but they can make that connection. And then we don't do anything with that after that. We say, if, the, if it blesses you to continue this after that, continue. Take each other's phone numbers and do that. So we have this kind of loosey-goosey way of mentoring, but it's been working really well. We'll have people, and we tell them, if you've had a good time today, you don't have to stay all day. Like If y'all are having a really good conversation and you want to take this to Panera Bread down the street, bye. Have a good time. Because the goal is not for us to have a program. The goal is for us to have a relationship. And so I want you to think about All of that, as you're doing this, the goal is to have a relationship. I'm going to talk for 60 seconds about communicating, and then we'll wrap this up. With whatever you have at your church, and I've listed plenty of ideas, women have to know about it. And women have to know about it in a way that makes sense for them to know. So if you have a congregation that's not digital at all, it needs to be in the bulletin, pasted on the bathroom mirror. When they close the bathroom stall, have one of those little plastic holder things, and whatever's coming up, put it there. 
make announcements and all of that. If you've got a digital generation, you know, they're going to take that bulletin on a Sunday morning and it's going to be there when they get up because they're not going to take it home and they're not going to look at it again. When they want the information, it's going to be when they're sitting at their computer at work and they're going to type it up and it needs to be on the website. We've started doing a couple of things where we are texting people and we are doing voice uh, voice calls. So we just leave one message and it blasts it out to everybody. We get more response from that because people are not even reading their email anymore. They get too many emails. So what works for your, uh, for your church? Do you need a Twitter for your women? Do you need a Facebook for your women? Do you need your own blog? Whatever works, but make sure that they understand that you love them, that you want to provide them with ministry opportunities, you want to serve them, and you want them to understand what's going on in the broader scope of your church. So with that, let me just encourage you, you know, there's so many women in here with different church backgrounds and in different situations, and there's so many different ways (laughs) that we could discuss this stuff, and we've provided some um, organizational charts for you to see how we're doing it here, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to do what God has asked you to do. Don't be afraid to take the initiative. Don't be afraid to do what has not been done at your church before. Don't be afraid to bring in new women, to do new things, and to do it in a new way. And don't get afraid when you get discouraged, because you will get discouraged. And somebody won't like the way you do it or the way that you ran that program. You have to know what God has called you to do and to be reminded of that when the road gets rough, because when you're dealing with God's people, it will get rough. Don't get discouraged and then resist perfectionism. There is no perfect and right way to do this thing. There is only God's way, and he will reveal that to you little by little as you do what little he has shown you with the light that he's giving you. So let me pray for you real quick and just encourage you in the Lord. Lord Jesus, every woman that's in this room, there's there's just so much that we could discuss and talk about and um, relate in terms of the way we do it at our church and the unique things that people do at their other church. But the bottom line is we want to serve your women. We want to meet them where we are. We want to do what you said do in the word, which is to mentor the women and to have older women teaching younger women. Whether, whether they're literally older or further along in the faith. And we want to have the systems in place to do that well. We want to serve our um, pastors that are in authority over us, and we want to serve you. So, Lord God, I just pray right now that for every woman in this room, that you would cause her to know one specific thing that she can take from this session to do practically, to believe in what you called her to do, and then to do it with confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give Crystal a hand for me. This is wonderful. Oh, my goodness. I'm so proud of you. Wow. Well, we still have time for some more questions, Crystal. Awesome. Yes, on your iPad. All right. And maybe there's a question in the audience. Any questions in the audience? Yes. Would you go to the mic right behind you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, what would you say is the best way to um, guide women to their seasons and help them understand the actual season they're in um, for their life? Meaning that women don't know when they're supposed to go to the next season? Or, or they don't, they're not sure what season they're in. Okay. What season am I in and how do I know when uh, I'm supposed to go to the next season? Well, the, and what is that season? Well, you know, there's so many different labels. We get caught up in labels. To me, there, is, there are only two. There's only two. You're, and we can describe them a lot of different ways. Um, you are either in a season where you are receiving or you're in a season where you're pouring out, or you're in both at the same time. Now, what that means is it could be me as a 30-year-old who has a couple of small children, but I'm a little bit ahead of the girl who has the newborn. So I'm in the season of ministering to her, but I'm also in the season of needing ministry from a woman who's further ahead of me on the road. Now, that season can be that I'm a young mom. Well, the same season is true of the woman who's 70 years old and who's a widow. She's a widow. That's the label. But she's in a season where she can pour out to other women who are behind her on the journey, spiritually or physically or practically. But she's also in a season where she needs to receive because she needs companionship and she needs friendship and she needs people to stop by and, um, and to pour into her life in that season where there's a gap, where there's something missing. So we can call different labels. We can have widows and we can have mothers and we can have... Um, uh, you know, seasons of ministry and all these different things. But I think people need to constantly be asking themselves those two questions. And you can answer those questions based on the experiences that God ha- either has given you or the experiences that he is giving you right now that you need help with. Does that help at all? Oh, that's good. Yeah. Let Very me say good. something else, if you don't mind, Crystal. Mm-hmm. Pastor Paul Shepard tweeted one time um, that an old preacher once said, 
If God hasn't given you any new directions, then he probably wants you to work in the directions he gave you the last time. <laughs> so just stay in that season until God kind of pushes you and um, forces you into a new season and gives you a new passion. Yeah, I mean, we, we like moving to the next season, don't we? Yeah. This is my season. As if the season that we're in, is, there's something wrong with it. But there's something about that with Christianity in general. We always want to move to the next, <laughs> to the next thing. Yes. Um, another question that we had was, what should I do when someone, as the pastor's wife, how should I respond when I hear someone speak against my husband or, you know, my husband pastor? I think, like you said earlier, you know, you have to um, pray about it. Ask the Lord's help, but feel free to actually speak with this person. It's like, I think you said that. We are constantly in a teaching mode. People don't know. Mm -hmm. um, that person probably really m thought she meant sincerely that she was helping the pastor. But for you, it was offensive. And quite frankly, I've done that many times. I just pull the sister aside, hold her hands, calming myself down in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> So I can give her a word that the God has given me to teach her, to let her know we're real people and what you've said, you meant it, you meant well. I know you did mean well, but it didn't come across well and it was very disrespectful. And so I use it, I call it my teaching ministry. So you educate the congregation as to how to treat you and respect you and even with the children. You know, and I know that was not the question, but I got involved in children's ministry because my kids were in children's ministry, and I wanted people to remind people that my children, some of them weren't saved yet. <laughs> and I was still working with them at home. And so what I did, instead of rebuking the teachers and disrespecting them, I just joined them in the children's program, and I was there to assist them with, really, just my child. <laughs> and that goes to that point of Jesus being a servant leader. He said, I'm going to show you how to do this. I could tell you, but some people really just need for you to get in the trenches with them and show them this is, this is how, it, how it happens. Another question that we had were, um, was a request for more resources. Um, we can probably maybe put this on the website after yes. today, yes. but I will go ahead and read some uh, that I have referenced. One is by Linda Lesniewski. It's called Connecting Women. So we'll put that on there so you can get the specific spelling of her name. But it's called Connecting Women. Vicki Kraft, who's in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, who's been faithfully mentoring women. Um, she's been the women's uh, leader at a, a church in our area, but she's also faithfully mentored many women personally that I know. And she says to them, one year, if you can't commit for one year, and this is how many times you can miss because I'm serious, and if you're serious, then this is not the group for you. And she's been doing this for 40 years. Every year, she gets a new group of women. Her book is called The Influential Woman. And again, her name is Vicki Kraft. Building an Effective Women's Ministry by Sharon James. And Designing an Effective Women's Ministry by Jill Briscoe. Mm. So those would be some book resources. And there's a couple of other online resources. But we'll put those up on the website so that you can access them after today's, uh, today's call or today's webcast. Webcast. Yeah, anybody in the audience? Another question? Yes, please, go to the mic, please. Um, in, in building my women's ministry, how do you deal with that one woman that's sort of against everything that you do mm. and sort of the naysayer, kind of speaking negatively about the events that you put together? Um, should I address that or should I have the pastor address mm. that? Well, I would say, since it's within the women's ministry, I would say the first thing for you to do, since it's, interaction that you're having would be for you to go to her. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely, um, you know, escalate to the pastor if that doesn't do it. <laughs> um, you know, and the Bible talks about that. You know, you, you, you go to that person directly. If that doesn't work, then you take a couple of people with you. If that doesn't work, then you bring in the big dogs. But I just think in general, a lot of people don't know. And sometimes even when they do know and we tell them, they need to be reminded you know, because it's their habit. They've been practicing being negative Nancy for all their life. <laughs> and so they just need to be reminded. And a lot of times they just need to be shown. So sometimes in my experience, when someone's being negative, they'll make a negative statement and I'll counteract it with a positive statement. Mm. So they'll say, oh, we don't even know if anybody's going to show up. Well, you know what? I believe that plenty of women are going to show up and everybody who needs what we're doing today will be here. Because a lot of times they just need to see what it's like to have a positive response. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to, to be the example. But yes, talk to her. Be very direct, loving. And then if that doesn't work. <laughs> and you know, sometimes when you're not feeling love, just as a practical thing, 
Smiling makes it feel like love. You know, you're looking at him and you're just smiling. And then your heart is all upside down and all turned around. Yeah. But the smile makes it come across like, you know, that's how you mean it. So, yeah, definitely. You know, if you might want to take someone with you, even in the first meeting. You know, if you're just uncomfortable because yeah. the person is so negative all the time. <laughs> You might just take someone with you, another sister in the church or somebody you're comfortable with, um, so you both talk to her for the first time. But Matthew 18 gives you those types of instructions, yeah. This says, how, um, well, should the pastor's wife be the overall director or advisor of the women's ministry? Um, I think that that's a question for the pastor's wife, <laughs> because I really believe, just as we were talking about each of us being in our own giftedness, the same is true for the pastor's wife. Now, she may have... She may want to lead the women's ministry, like full effect and like hold all the meetings and send all the emails and all that. But a lot of times there are so many other things that, um, that she's involved in. Maybe it's her family or maybe it's things that her husband is asking her to do. And she really needs to be more in an, uh, in an advisory capacity right. because she's got the heart of the pastor and she understands what he's trying to do and wants to make sure that that's infiltrated um, as the women's ministry is doing different things. It's really up to her her availability, and what she wants to do. I mean, in our situation, mm -hmm. um, would you say that you're in an advisory capacity? And I love it. <laughs> because I think the scripture, again, is people's different giftedness. Mm -hmm. And so you can do it the way you'd like. But we need to remember that the scripture says we're about equipping the saints mm -hmm. to do the work of the ministry. And sometimes as pastors, wives, or women in ministry, we get so absorbed with it that we own it. Um, and we miss the fact that ownership means you need to learn to delegate. Amen. Okay, so the next question we have is, how do I recruit volunteers? <laughs> um, I can use help, but no matter what I try, the women won't come forward. Yeah. Um, you know, we ask a lot, and I know that we ask, and we want women to respond and come forward because we ask, but the reality is is that sometimes they don't come forward until you ask them 10 million times. <laughs> so the first thing I want to say is just to encourage um, you to keep asking. It makes me think about Peter. You know, it took Peter a few times to get it right. You know what I mean? He, right. God kept giving him the same message over and over again, and it took him a minute for it to register, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to rise to the, the calling that God has wow. given me. And sometimes that's the same way with women. Mm -hmm. You have to tell them, um, ask for their help, continually ask for their help. But also, as you specifically see women who have certain giftings, I would encourage them in that. You know, you are so good at this. Have you ever thought about helping? So you cast these general nets like God did with the 5,000, Jesus did it with the 5,000. You cast specific nets that you do with the 12 because you see certain things in them and you want to call them out on those things. And most people, unless they're just, you know, being ornery, <laughs> if you're telling them that there's something that they do well and that you need them and they have the capability of helping, they will help. Sometimes people are... Um, intimidated because you're asking for help and they don't really know what to do. And so as you get to know specific women and specifically say, hey, you're really good at caring for people. Have you ever thought about writing cards or making calls or whatever? Right, you know, that's right. something specific. Right. Yeah. And also I think the women that you're working with, you can ask them to look within their circles mm -hmm. for people that are, could be volunteers. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As oh, you're yeah. mentoring them, you could also ask them to be mentoring people that could become volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. I know that the, um, one of the events that we do, the, the uh, mid-sized group event that we do two or three times a year, every time we um, ask the ladies to fill out an evaluation. And on okay. every evaluation at the bottom, it says, would you like to help in the future? Yeah. And they have to say yes or no. <laughs> um, and once they say yes, they're not committing to anything specific. We just then have their email. And then we email them and say, here's where we need help. Would you like to help in these areas? And 20% of them will respond with yes. 80% say no. But because we keep doing that every time, we've right. developed a huge list of women who are willing to at least get the email right. that they are, that, you know, to see if we need help or not. And then what do we do after, you know, when we get an abundance of volunteers, are we ready for them? And how should we be ready for them? Well, when we send out that email, we also send it out with the specific slots that are available. Okay. And we know which slots are available for anybody. Okay. And then there are certain ones that are only available for, uh, they have to be tapped on the shoulder. They have to be requested. And we make that clear. So when they sign up, they're looking at that list and they're saying, I'm signing up for this because this is when I'm available and this is what I don't mind doing. Right. 
So I think asking a specific question is helpful as right, well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Question. So the next question is, how do you balance the age gap? Sometimes I hear that the young people have kicked the old people out. How do you integrate <laughs> the young and the old? Um, I just think that goes back to what I've said over and over again is you really want to know your women at your church and know what they enjoy doing. Yes. So we were very strategic about picking some activities that anybody could do. So one of them was Zumba. We had Zumba. We would do that. <laughs> We've done that at a different events um, because anybody can do that. And any, everybody likes good music. And you'd be surprised. Even some of the women who didn't want to actually do the Zumba, right. they wanted to sit at the tables in the back and watch. <laughs> and where you have food, they, a lot of times they will come and sit. So, right, right. Um, so you do want to be strategic. But I think it's okay to have some things that are for younger people and some things that are for folks that have a little bit of years on them. But you want to be strategic about what will work for both. When we did a, a getaway last fall, yeah. we did a getaway where we had two things planned, a meeting in the morning on a Friday and a meeting in the evening on a Friday. And the rest of the weekend was do what you want to do. And so we had two big things where all ages could come together, but we left people plenty of time to get together with, you know, their people and to do their right, thing. Right. And some women wanted to shop and some women wanted to go to the spa, but they right. got a chance to do what worked for them. Well, I like what you do at Gathering of the Girls. Crystal um, does a great job with organizing Gathering of the Girls. And I like what you do in that you integrate the matured women with the younger women in that you ha have them teach or share or mentor, sit at a praying table, something, so the younger women are able to meet them. So, and they feel valuable to the church because they're able to share their expertise and um, their maturity with the younger crowd. So you integrate them really well and uh, in an unassuming way, but they feel really charged up that you still need them. Yeah. So I love that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because by, by, by recognizing where people either have been where they've lived, their experiences, or what they're good at, yeah. you give people a chance to serve in an area where they're comfortable. Right. And that area doesn't have to be age specific, mm. but it lets people of different ages do what works for them. Yeah. So the women who want to teach quilting, they teach quilting and they do the sewing. And there are some younger women who show up for that. And the younger women who want to talk about, you know, I'm trying to get my resume together. We have something for that as well. So I think as long as you're continuously surveying women and asking them what they need and what they want and then providing a way for them to exercise their gifts, that's partially how you can close some of that. Yeah. Down. You know, remember, you are not the consumer. The people in the church right. are the ones that you really want to minister to. So you, when you sit around a table, like Crystal just said, you look at surveys you, and you look specifically at your congregation and that, the um, demographics and all of that there and the needs, and that's the needs you, you look uh, you work towards meeting. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions that we ask on that survey, just to be real specific, is what do you like to do for fun? We're not asking them, <laughs> what do you want your women's ministry to do? We're, we're not asking them, you know, what kind of Bible study would you like to study? You know, we ask them that too. But I want to know, what do you like to do for fun? I want to know when you're not at church, <laughs> what are you doing? And then we try to craft experiences around just what people like doing. And yes. sometimes we shoot for what this age group likes, and sometimes we shoot for what this age group likes, and yes. everybody seems to be happy. Yes, they are. Any more questions you have? Yeah, one, one more question, um, specifically talking about how to get started. Because we have some women who are, they're just trying to, maybe their women's ministry is in shambles, and they're trying to restart it, or they don't really have one, and where do I start? It's three things. The first thing is, uh, and I mentioned this before, but keep it simple. To start a women's ministry, your women's ministry does not have to look like the church down the street or the church around away. It right. can look like what your church needs and what you can support. So that may mean all you have is a Bible study. Or it may mean you don't start anything from scratch. Maybe you just let a mops group meet at your church. Okay. Or maybe you, um, we've seen actually some churches get together because mm -hmm. neither one of them had the resources to pull off a whole weekly Bible study or a whole retreat. retreat. So two or three churches in an area got together, pulled their resources, and made it happen because they all were in a five-mile radius. Do what you can do and start small. You don't start having to do it all well all at the same time. Start with what you can do and then let God grow you as he provides resources and people. Um, and the second thing um, I would say about that is make sure that you um, are, are communicating clearly to the women what you're trying to do and don't feel like you have to start just because everybody else has something. Take your time and base your women's ministry on the feedback that you've taken the time to get from the women at your church. Right, and you said it though, as you're taking your time and starting where you are, 
keep looking for the woman that you could mentor. That's right. To assist you. You're always looking for somebody you can mentor and disciple and grow into their potential. Again, like I said earlier, because your job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. That's right. All right, wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us again. Applaud my daughter. I'm so proud of her. She did an excellent job today. And this recording will be on our website, and the notes will be up, and all the references Crystal mentioned. And we're so glad you joined us. It's loisevans.org. And we also have a Facebook network group. And all of that is online. So just go online again. We're here to resource you to walk alongside you what God has called you to do in training and equipping you to love the ministry that God has called you to. Because Jeremiah 1.5 says, before you were put in your mother's womb, it might be a shock to you, but exactly where you are today is exactly where God had predestined for your life. So we just want to come alongside you and partner with you in ministry. God bless you and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs>